Hello everyone, this is Sharon Bornholt with the Louisville Gals Real Estate Blog, and I'm really happy to have my friend and fellow real estate investor, Bill Walston, with me today. Bill is um, a multifamily real estate investor. He's a CPA, a tax strategist, and a lease option expert. And we're going to talk today about something that uh, all the real estate investors need to know about, and that is the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, so we're going to dive right into that today. Hello, Bill. Hey, Sharon. How's it going? Uh, it's going good. Um, you know, this has been the SAFE Act discussions have been going on for just about ever, and now we've got the Dodd Frank Act. So um, tell us, yeah. tell us exactly what what is the difference between these two things? Okay. Well, the the big difference between the Dodd Frank Act and the SAFE Act is the SAFE Act actually covered who could write the loan documents, basically. So it, it requires a mortgage loan originator for some types of, of loans, depending on you know, what the circumstances are and what the state rules and regs are. The Dodd-Frank Act goes a lot further and actually affects the lender itself. So you, know, you can be the lender and not be writing the loan documents. So the, the SAFE Act is going to cover cover both. So uh, SAFE Act actually falls under the Dodd-Frank Act now, so they work in combo. Uh, it used to be, you know, that, that these rules and regs did not apply to us as investors, only applied to traditional banks. But I'll tell you, you know, the government is getting more and more involved with us as investors now. And, it, and it's not just Dodd-Frank. There are a lot of new rules and regulations. You know, a few years ago they started with MARS, which was the Mortgage Assistance uh, mortgage assistance Rescue Services, mm-hmm. which affected, you know, who, who you could talk to about short sales. Mm-hmm. Okay, then they came up with the SAFE Act, which was the uh, Secure and Fair Enforcement for Mortgage Licensing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then they had uh, the Truth in Lending Act, which talks about how much interest you can charge. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, a lot of states have equity protection laws. Uh, where you have folks going into court uh, complaining about us big bad investors coming in and stripping out all the equity in their properties, you know. Uh, and then there were a lot of foreclosure prevention laws. But, you know, I think the biggest one coming down the pike has been, you know, the, the um, Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which is what it's really called, which really kind of worries me whenever you talk about Wall Street and consumer protection, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it is going to affect everybody. Well, originally, wasn't this, didn't it start out to be a way of protecting consumers and, and, and really ruling the bankers? It Wasn't that the original intent of the law? That was the intent, okay? That was, that was really the intent. Uh, the, the intentions were good because it, it basically was saying that as a lender, the lenders had to take into consideration the borrower's ability to repay, you know, which I think they ought to be doing that to begin with. However, you know, that, I, I think in a way that's trying to take some of the responsibility off of those idiot borrowers who went out and bought property they knew they weren't going to be able to pay for. So, you know, it, it on both sides, mm-hmm. all right. But the intent of the law was really, really very good. I, I just think it's taken, you know, way too far. And Dodd Frank is going to affect everyone in real estate investing because it's going to drastically alter the way that homeowners are going to be able to finance their properties. Yeah, you know? and it's going to hit the fan. <laughs> Well, it is, and this goes into effect in about the middle of January. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, January 10. But yeah, Dodd Frank itself was signed into law back in July of 2010. You know, it's just kind of been sitting there and simmering. And uh, then finally, uh, in what 20? Let's see, uh, 2013. In July 2013, it was put under the purview of the Consumer the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, all right, the CFPB, and I'm sure you've heard of those. That really bothers me as well because, believe it or not, the CFPB doesn't have any oversight. Mm. Okay, they're going to to run the rules and regulations, but they answer to absolutely no one. Okay, the president appoints. 
Yeah, it really is. The president appoints the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Remember, that's when Obama was having all the problems, mm-hmm. you know, uh, getting getting that, that first part. I think it was supposed to be Elizabeth Warren that he originally wanted in there, and then finally he put in somebody else. And the only way he ever got anybody in was to do a recess appointment. Uh, but they, they, they don't answer to anybody. Okay, so they they finally finalized the rules in July of 2013. I'm sorry, January 10th of 2013. They go into effect January 10th of uh, 2014, and those new rules are going to apply to every single loan application that's taken after that time. Wow, wow, that that's a big thing. Now you touched yeah, it's on- a really big thing because. Yeah, basically what that means is that anybody who is extending what we call consumer financing Mm -hmm. to a homeowner, okay, it it doesn't make any difference if you're a homeowner trying to to do seller financing on your property, whether you're a real estate investor doing seller financing, or whether you are a private lender Mm -hmm. who is going to be loaning money on a uh, on, on a residential property, it's going to be affected and you're going to fall under the rules and regulations and you're going to have to consider how the loan is written okay, as well as uh, whether the, the uh, borrower can repay that loan. It's, it's going to be kind of you know, wretched. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, wretched, wretched. Wretched, okay. Um, I wanted to go a little bit into something you touched on, and that is qualifying the buyers. Um, I know with real estate investors in particular, the standard was kind of to look the people over and run their credit. And if that looked okay, mm-hmm. then that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, I, yeah. I don't know of a single person that would sat down and said, how much are your debts and what's your debt-to-income ratio or any of those things. It, it just never yeah. came up. So tell, what's that process going to be like now, do you think, for a real estate investor? Yeah, it's, it's going to be, cons- be really, really kind of rigid. Uh, you're going to have to look at a lot more, a lot more things. Uh, at one time, Lord, it, even with banks, you know, if you could fog a mirror, you could get along. Right. And that kind of put us into what the problem is right now. Dodd Frank is going to say, okay, here's the situation. If you write residential loans, you're going to be covered mm-hmm. one way or the other. Now, there are some exemptions to Dodd Frank. Okay, but if you don't fall under one of those exemptions under Dodd Frank, you're going to have to do some underwriting your in your loans. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can write loans any way that you want to, as long as you consider eight underwriting factors. And you've got to look at all eight of them. And I jotted it down. Let's see. Uh, the first thing you have to do is look at the current income of the of the borrower. You've got to look at their current employment status, you've got to look at their monthly loan payment, you've got to look at the loan payments on any other loans that they have, you've got to look at any mortgage obligations that they already have, uh, you've got to look at their alimony and child support obligations, you've got, you mentioned debt to income ratio, you've got to look at their debt to income ratio and any residual income that they have and make sure they have a 43% DTI, and then you've also got to look at their credit history. So you've got to consider all eight of those factors if you're going to write along any way you want to. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and you've got to document that you've looked at those. You've got to have internal underwriting requirements, your own underwriting requirements, and they say those standards have to be reasonable. So they're going to look at you like a bank and say, "Are you underwriting these loans?" I don't see that affecting individual sellers as much as I do people who were doing private lending on on uh, residential property but that's that's the way it's going to be now the other the other way you can do to get around those eight underwriting factors mm-hmm. is to write only what uh, Dodd Frank is going to be considered a qualified loan okay mm-hmm. so they've got two types of loans they've got non-qualified loans they've got qualified loans if you want to write loans the way we used to with balloon payments and you know short amortization terms and high interest rates and things like that you're going to have to follow those eight underwriting criteria are those, if you write, those are non-qualified loans yeah those are what we call non-qualified non-qualified
qualifying loans. Okay. All right. And then you, the other option is to write only a qualified loan. Okay, and a, a, qual- a qualified loan means that it cannot have any negative amortization. Okay, remember sometimes we used to do that as investors. We would right. uh, we would charge an interest rate, and we would try to make the payments so low to help the people out that they didn't even cover the interest, and we just kind of like added it onto the principal. Can't do that anymore. Uh, you can't have any balloon payments. All right, so that gets out the, all these folks who used to write. Uh, uh, you know, uh, amortize, amortize over 30 years and you know, have a balloon payment in five. Can't do that anymore. Uh, you can't exceed a 30 year term. Uh, so we, you know, we used to amortize. I've, I've seen back in the old days, you know, people would amortize over 40 years to make the payment lower for their, for their borrower and then have a 10 year balloon. You know, right. Um, can't do that anymore. Uh, you cannot have a prepayment penalty that's in, in excess of a schedule that they're going to have. They haven't written the schedule yet, but they said once we write that schedule, your prepayment penalty can't exceed that schedule. And you can have a variable interest rate. But you have to do your underwriting based on the highest interest rate that might occur during the first five-year period. It, it's going to get very, very complicated even to have a qualified loan. You know, so I think that uh, a lot of investors, if they try to do qualified loans, uh, they're not going to have the variable interest rate. But that's going to be your choice. If you fall under Dodd-Frank and have to qualify under Dodd-Frank, you're going to either have to use those eight underwriting factors or you're going to have to write only qualified loans. Now, the best of all worlds is if we as investors can you know, find an exemption to Dodd-Frank. And, and work outside of it, but you know that's a that's another thing. And even with the qualified loans, you're still going to have to verify income. Okay. Okay. But you aren't going to have to go into the extreme underwriting of taking a look at you know their whole credit history, their employment status, and all that. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to get quite as complicated. It's going to be complicated and it's going to be tricky, and there's going to be a lot of ways that investors can get tripped up in this process just by oh, absolutely. making a mistake. Ab- ab- absolutely. And, and so the best thing that people are going to, that I recommend is try to make sure that you fall outside of Dodd-Frank. Okay. And when I, when I say fall outside of Dodd-Frank, you're still going to be covered under Dodd-Frank, okay? but there are exceptions to the qualified and non-qualified loans. Uh, for instance, remember I, I said Dodd-Frank only applies to consumer loans? Right. All right. And that means someone who is going to actually live in the house. So if you are an investor selling to another investor, you're going to be okay. You got Those types of transactions. Okay. And you're going to be exempt. You don't have to worry about Dodd-Frank. Okay. Uh, so I've, and, and I hear so many different stories floating around out there. A lot of people don't really know what they're talking about when, they, when they're talking to Dodd-Frank. And one of the reasons is because nothing's been settled yet as far and, and tried in court. You know, there's no case law. There's no precedence. I don't want to be the first one. Okay, but there aren't any right now that we can kind of sink our teeth into to say, okay, this is the definitive way it's got to be. So right now, a lot of stuff is going to be open to interpretation. Okay, one thing that's not open to interpretation is the fact that it only applies to consumer loans. So don't let anybody tell you that, you know, if you're selling to another investor, you've got to worry about Dodd-Frank because you do not. Okay, so that's one way around it. Uh, the other is all cash transactions. All cash transactions are not affected. Okay, it's only going to be financed transactions. Mm-hmm. Another thing that you know a lot of people got all bit out of shape of. We as investors can buy with seller financing all day long. We don't have to worry about it mm-hmm. if we're buying. If you're buying with seller financing, so if we can find somebody to sell to us on seller financing, we're golden because we don't have to worry about that. Our problem comes when we want to sell to someone else. Uh, and that's when we have to start worrying about the, the seller financing. Uh, another way around is the number of transactions that you do. Uh, there is what is called a de minimis provision. And the uh, 12 CFR 226.2 uh, says that a person 
regularly extends consumer credit if extended credit more than 25 times or more than five times for transactions secured by dwelling in a 12-month period. So if you're going to do fewer than five transactions in a in a calendar period, okay, you fall under that exemption. So you don't have to worry about Dodd Frank. One caveat that I would put under that though is if you're going to be one of those who try to, to get outside those underwriting rules by doing less than five transactions, you need to disclose that. Okay, and put in like fourteen point type in your loan documents that your loan falls under a Dodd-Frank exclusion and the penalties and stuff would not apply because there are some hefty penalties that can apply if you do not comply with Dodd-Frank. Okay, and so we need to let the borrowers know up front that, hey, guys, you aren't going to be able to take advantage of those penalties under Dodd-Frank because Dodd-Frank doesn't apply to the end of this loan. Because I can see a poor consumer now trotting into court saying, he may have only done four transactions, but he didn't tell me that Dodd Frank didn't apply, and I wouldn't have borrowed from him if if I had known that, you know, that type of thing. Because I will tell you, Sharon, the, the government is not going to enforce Dodd Frank. It's going to be your pissed off borrower and his attorney that's going to enforce Dodd Frank. Right. I, th- I think um, I think that's important for people to understand that. And, and I think that's a great point you made about putting that in your loan documents. Uh, that actually never crossed my mind because even with the SAFE Act, folks were hung up on that five transactions. If I only do five transactions, then I'm safe. So what you're saying yep. is that even if they're doing five transactions, they need to have some sort of language in there to set that says that right up front. And you need to say that to a buyer, much like yep. you would say if you were doing a lease. You understand yes. this is what's going to happen if you do A, B, and C. You know, and, and right. really right. have them maybe even yeah. you need to, that in the paperwork that they exactly you need to yeah you need to let them know that hey those penalties that you might get from somebody else because they have to comply with Dodd Frank doesn't apply to this seller finance loan. Okay. So way hey, I want to talk about the penalties in just a minute, but um, okay. one thing I wanted to ask you about before we go there is what about lease options? Um, okay. How does this affect uh, people that are sort of on rent-to-own programs or lease, op- lease options? Well, like, like all good professionals, I will answer that with, it depends. Okay. <laughs> uh, in theory, okay, a lease option does not convey title, so it's not a sale. Right. Okay. And as long as it is not a sale, it is not, co- it is not considered seller financing mm-hmm. and it is not covered by Dodd-Frank. Mm-hmm. That being said, there are a lot of gurus out there who teach people to do lease options, and they are so close to a sale, I would be scared. Uh, and I think you've heard of situations where a tenant buyer goes into court and says, oh, no, I was buying this property, and, and they, the judge rules on like an equitable interest type thing. Mm-hmm. If that ever happens, I think Dodd-Frank is going to apply. And, uh, and, and another way is to look at it as IRS, okay? And, you know, for years and years, lease option people have had to contend with the fact that IRS would sometimes go back and try to treat a lease option as an installment sale. We have to be careful about how the leases were written. If, if that can happen, and if the Internal Revenue Service ever went back, and ever said that this is not a true lease and option, it's an installment sale, then I think Dodd-Frank is going to apply. So the way the uh, IRS looked at that is the term of the lease. Anything that was over three years, they began to say, okay, this may be more of a sale than a lease option. So I would keep my leases under three years. Uh, if any part of the monthly payment, goes to what is considered the payment of the property, they might say, okay, you know, you're actually having some of the monthly payment go towards the the payment of the property. That's that's a sale. You know, that's more of a sale than it is a lease. So I would be careful of this idea of giving these humongous rent credits. I think a small rent credit might be acceptable, but I've seen people give up to 50% rent credits. I've seen 100% rent credits back in the day. Yeah, back in the day, and that would definitely, definitely not fly. Uh, so I'd be very, very careful with rent credits. 
And we one of the favorite points about a lease option is we used to be able to turn over all the repairs and maintenance to the tenant buyer, right? Can't do that anymore because owners are responsible for repairs and maintenance, not tenants. Now, I think we can turn over the small day-to-day stuff. I think clogged toilets and things like that, we can turn over to them. But I think any repairs on furnace or roof repairs or anything like that that I've seen so many people try to pour pour over onto the tenant buyers, we're not going to be able to do that. So I answer the question in two ways. If your lease option deal or your rent to own is going to be strictly a lease and an option and it would stand up as a lease and an option, I think you're perfectly safe. Uh, If it can be treated as an installment sale, I think you're going to run into problems and be covered under the lease uh, under the Dodd Frank Act. So that being said, what you may want to do if you're doing lease options is to do a little bit of underwriting. And I, I have a good friend who already does that. You probably need to do a credit check at least mm-hmm. to see if they can afford the, the monthly rent payments. I don't think, I, I think you should confirm uh, employment. Okay, but those are things that I've always done, haven't you? Right, right. You know, if you had, you know, if you had a tenant, I've always checked out their credit rating. I've always checked out, you know, whether they actually worked where they said they did and could make the payments and stuff like that. I just think we have to document it a little better and and keep our documentation. And most most people, um, I know, um, my daughters are both both happen to be property managers, and they both use debt to income ratios. And I think, Mm -hmm. um, and I always did that too because if you look at it, and if they don't, they they just don't make enough money in some cases that you know they're going to be able right. to afford that payment. And even on a, right. just an apartment, your or a rental house, you're just doing them a giant insert. You know, it's just terrible to let them have that place that you know you're going to have to evict them from. Exactly. Exactly. We want them to be able to get in there. We want them to be able to complete their lease. We want them to be able to get their to get their credit fixed, and we want them to be able to exercise their option. And I think we need to use a little common sense in who we put into those properties. I don't think we have to go to the same extent of underwriting that we would if it were a subject to deal or something like that. But I think we do need to do some semblance of underwriting so that we can go back and we can tell a judge, say, hey. This was a true lease and an option, okay, but if you're going to make it an installment sale, we have covered our bases and we did make sure that they could make these payments. Right, right. That's a, I think for most of us, we've probably always done that in, in a similar manner. Maybe not had hit every point, but most of those points we've hit just because it's a pain in the neck to have to evict somebody. You'd rather get a tenant oh, absolutely. That, can, that can pay or exercise their option. So right. um, now we've talked a little bit about penalties, and um, I know mm-hmm. that penalties are stiff, and I want people to be clear on this. Oh, if they are caught, and yeah. uh, because I hear it almost every day in some of the forums, oh, you know, they're not going to come after me. I'm a small guy, and I've got just a few properties, and. You try to explain to them it's your tenant that's going to get you in trouble or the attorneys that have exactly. ads on TV. You know, have you been wronged by your landlord? And so explain yep. to everybody that they really want to take this seriously. Yeah, basically, yeah, well, we've already talked about the rules for complying. And the major, the major requirement of Dodd-Frank is that you consider the borrower's ability to repay. And then we went through all those under underwriting factors that, that you had to take into consideration. So essentially what happens is if your borrower goes into court and sues you based on the fact that you did not take into consideration their ability to repay the loan, and if their lawsuit is successful, Okay, you have to repay the previous three years of monies that that tenant buyer has paid you. And that's just not the monthly payments. That is all payments. So if they made a down payment, you know, uh, a, a very large down payment, that would have to be paid back. All of the monies that they paid for the previous what, uh, 36 months, plus the attorney's fees and the court costs. So it is pretty steep. 
Very, very steep is what I would say. And, and all they have to prove, okay, and all they have to get a judge to believe is that you did not take into, their, into consideration their ability to repay. And that's why I said that you have to do that underwriting. And when you do the underwriting, you have to make sure that you document that. And so if you don't write a qualified loan, remember we talked about non-qualified and qualified loans. If you do not write a qualified loan and you have to consider those eight underwriting factors, I think you're in a, um, you're not in as good of a position as someone who wrote a qualified loan. Because basically, if you write what is called a qualified loan, the presumption is that you complied with Dodd Frank, and the uh, and your tenant buyer would have to, or your buyer, if it's a contract for deed, uh, your borrower, let's call it a borrower, your borrower would have would have the burden of proof that you did not mm-hmm. comply because right. with a qualified loan, it is assumed that you complied with Dodd Frank, and that's why I also said that you probably, if you're going to try to get outside of Dodd Frank and not be covered by Dodd Frank mm-hmm. by staying under the five, mm-hmm. you need to let that that borrower know up front that, hey, you don't have the ability to take me to court because I, I'm not covered by Dodd-Frank under right. this transaction. Right. Yeah, that's, and that's really, really a sticky wicket. Uh, yeah. But, but it, it gets even better. Okay, let's say that your borrower has been paying for the last five years. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then all of a sudden they don't pay anymore. Mm-hmm. And you decide that you're going to try to foreclose on your borrower. Right. Okay. Uh, so you try to go in and you start the foreclosure process. If that borrower goes in and proves that you, that you did not comply with Dodd Frank, let's say they didn't make the last six months payments. Right. Okay. And if your borrower can go in and prove that you did not comply with with Dodd Frank, you get back the last. You have to give them back the last 36 months, less the last six months, okay? So that would be an offset. So since they didn't pay you the last six months, you would only have to pay them back 30 months. All right? So it's really, really a pain in the butt. And I see a lot of people, you know, I can just foresee a lot of people using this as a defense in foreclosure suits. Okay. Yeah. Not only that, it, it it also requires, speaking of foreclosure, it adds four months to the foreclosure process. So whatever the foreclosure process is in your state, mm-hmm. okay, Dodd Frank adds an additional four months to that in order to make sure that you're complying with everything. It is going to be a nightmare. Oh my word! Um, now there. They're not going to go back retroactively, though. No, this. this only applies. Yeah, this only applies to any loans that are written after January 10, 2014. 14, so, okay. if you go to any any seller finance, yeah, any seller finance loans up to that point mm-hmm. uh, will not be covered by Dodd Frank. Right. Okay. So, I would recommend it. Yeah, I would recommend anybody who is in the midst of a seller financing transaction that they try to close it before the end of this year, right. just so to be on the safe side. Would fall under the Safe Act. Any of them were written. Uh, yes. Yeah. Fall because fall yeah. Because Safe Act. Yeah. Safe Act is basically basically in place right now. But remember, Safe Act do, does not have these penalties. Right. They okay. Don't have safe Act has to do with mortgage loan origination and who can actually write the loan and right. stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with the lender himself unless the lender is actually trying to write the loan himself and do all the do all the paperwork and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Safe Act really doesn't have the teeth that I think Dodd Frank does. I think I think this is another case of yeah showing just how important it is to have systems. If you have a file and it has every one of those steps, you know, a checklist and did I do this and where's my documentation, record keeping and systems and forms are going to be so important in this process and they're going to help keep you from just letting something slide by just that you just didn't get done by accident. Yep. 
I, I totally agree. Uh, systems are going to be even more important now than what they used to be. Um, and and it's, it's going to be interesting. And as I said, there is no case law yet. Uh, so it's um, it, it'll be interesting to see how the rules and regs are applied. But you made a very good point when you said that a lot of people think, oh, the government doesn't enforce this act and the government doesn't enforce that act, and I'm only a small guy, so they're going to go after Donald Trump before they go after me, and you know that type of deal. And it's just not so because the government is not going to have to go out and enforce the act. It's going to be your tenants that get, or your buyers that get ticked off at you and their attorneys. Because like you, I can see all the billboards now saying, you know, have you bought a house with seller financing? I can get your last three years payments back. Right. You know? Right. It's going to be interesting. Right. And, and then it's going to be a lot of time, times, I think it's going to be people that just didn't do, they're not, they didn't mean to not do it right, but they just didn't do it right. But I know last right. night on TV, I saw two or three ads for people that, you know, they were accident related. Have you been in an automobile accident? Did, did you have a hip replacement to, within the past two years? They're just looking for clients and tenants. Um, oh, yeah. some, some tenants are perfect for those type of advertisements. Oh, yeah. Yeah, any of them are. And you know as well as I, there are a lot of, there are some tenants out there and tenant buyers who try to game the system. We saw that with, with short sales. You know, with what they called it, when they, 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 uh, tried to put a, put a nice spin on it and refer to it as strategic default. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't care whether they called it strategic default or I don't make enough money to pay my bills. You know, it was still yeah. defaulting on a mortgage. And I think strategic default, you know, people say, well, it's just a business decision. Oh, don't even get me started on that. So I, I, I don't need to talk about strategic default today. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another topic, isn't it? Exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for clearing all this up. I know it's a topic that people, um, people, first of all, are not taking it seriously. And right. there is a lot of misinformation out there about it. Um, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Time will tell how all this eventually plays out, but I have a feeling there's going to be a whole lot of surprise people out there. Oh, I think so too. And and it's there. There are a few takeaways I think that you can get from this. Um, I think there are going to be some investors who are just going to stop trying to do seller financing to people. And, you know, a lot of investors say, well, it doesn't apply to me. And if you're just doing wholesales, it may not. But, you know, there are rehabbers out there who used to flip a house. And when they would sell, they might would sell on seller financing. So, you know, if, if you do that, you're going to fall under Dodd-Frank. All right. So your choice is going to be, I'm only going to sell to people who can get conventional financing. Well, conventional financing is going to be just as tight in the future as it has been right now. All right. There's still going to be tight conventional financing. So what we as investors have to do is find out how we can comply with Dodd-Frank. And what really, you know, chaps my butt sometimes is people spend more time trying to think of ways to get around the law than to comply with it. I mean, if you look at it, it's not going to be that difficult to comply with it. You deal with consumers, okay, or commercial, you know, it doesn't apply to commercial properties, so you can do commercial properties, okay, or you get a mortgage loan originator to write your loans, you know, comply with the law, or you might, you know, end up with some problems. Uh, but getting back to, to the conventional financing, one of the reasons I think it's going to get even tighter than what it is right now, for securitization purposes, in order to be able to sell their loans and stuff on the open market, there had to be a 20% down payment associated with the loan. That's going to 30%. Don Frank's making that go up to 30%. So, you know, not too many people out there are going to be able to attach a 30% down payment to their loans. I think conventional financing is going to be a bit tighter than what it is right right now. Uh, so they're going to be a lot of good opportunities for investors who understand how to stay within Dodd-Frank and to comply. I think we're still going to have, you know, 
I, I think we're going to have good opportunities. I see some of the thing, same types of investing coming back that were, you know, strategies and techniques that we used years ago. I get so abused at people who talk about, oh, I just learned this new strategy. Yeah, I was doing that back in 1980, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I think some of those things are coming are, are coming back now. So Dodd Frank is going to have a few good provisions for some of us as investors in it. Those are some of the takeaways. We just need to comply. We need to understand it. We need to find people who understand it uh, and just make sure that we're in compliance with it. Well, I agree completely. Um, and I thank you so much for coming on today and explaining all of this. And um, I think it, I think it really helps folks to have people to just give it to them in a common sense way that they can apply it in their business. And you're so good at that. So. Uh, Thanks for coming on and doing that. And I want to be sure that everybody stops by Bill's website, BillOnBusiness or BillWalston.com. That's the one you want the one to go to. Yeah. Yeah, that's Scott, the one. They, they can pick up a uh, an audio there. Yeah, pick up a free audio on talking lease options. So, and I know that uh, Bill's going to have some other things coming along the way. So be sure and sign up to. Um, you know, get his uh, get on his list because he has a lot of great things he gives away and a lot of great trainings that he has. And uh, uh, whether it's taxes or lease options or whatever you want to talk about, Bill can pretty much talk about any of it. So thanks again, Bill, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. See you later.